ahead and get us started. So hello and welcome to this next session of the PCE3 seminar series. I'm Becca Goose Metzler. I'm one of the organizers along with James Iguchi, Danielle Simkis, and uh, Albert Berenbach. And um, if you're not familiar with this series, what we do is every three weeks, we bring to you a topic in prebiotic chemistry and early earth environments. And um, in that topic, we will hear from uh, three speakers. So we'll have an introduction by Jim Cleves, and then we will hear from Jen Peng and Ankit Jane. Uh, but before we get rolling, what we often do is start out with a poll just to see who's here for this uh, session in messy systems. So I think that should pop up momentarily. There we are. And just take a few seconds to fill out this poll. Let us know who you are, where you're coming in from. And um, so while doing that, I will introduce Jim Cleves, who, there we are is an organic geochemist whose interests include the origins of life and life detection. He received his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and is the president of the International Society for the Scientific Study of the Origins of Life. Uh, so Jim, you can start us off. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> just have a few brief slides to introduce this uh, topic for today. Um, so the, the concept of messy systems um, is a route that we recently been introduced to the, to the study of the of prebiotic chemistry. And I'd like to give a shout out to my former colleague, Irina Mamajanov for um, coming up with the concept of messy chemistry, um, which I didn't, didn't think would catch on at the time, but apparently it has. As a, as a title for this, and what is it exactly? Um, we're gonna hear two talks by Jim about different aspects of, of solving the uh, issue of messy systems and how to go about studying them. Um, but briefly, uh, to give you a context, living systems are, are highly organized uh, collections of chemicals that process energy and matter to um, create copies of themselves in a heritable and mutable fashion. And the question of how we go from um, a biological chemistry to biological chemistry is very much the topic of prebiotic chemistry. Um, and to take an example of, of where messiness enters into this, um, we have the example of the Miller-Urey experiment um, back from 1953, in which some electricity was passed through a collection of reduced gases, um, then thought to mimic the atmosphere, um, which produced a variety of chemicals of biological importance, um, as could be appreciated at the time using uh, paper chromatography and staining. Um, of course, over time, our chemical uh, analytical methods have gotten better, and we can perceive that there are actually a lot more compounds produced in this experiment, and even more recent analysis using uh, tongue of light mass spectrometry reveals that there may be um, tens of thousands of unique products produced by these sort of systems, these sorts of experiments. And that phenomenon turns out to also be true of things like carbonaceous meteorites, which are thought by some to have provided building box uh, systems on Earth. So to put that in, in some context, um, we go from this question of prebiotic chemistry that potentially makes an enormous diversity of compounds that has to somehow be winnowed through or self-select um, to, to get around this kind of disorganization to give rise to the highly coordinated chemical systems we call them, right? And so there's a lot of uh, things to study here in terms of whether it's kinetic or thermodynamic restrictions or perhaps catalysis that'll get us out of the weeds of this. Um, but we're gonna hear some, some really exciting talks today about this. So right now I'll turn it over to um, Shen Peng um, to tell us what he has to say. So thank you.
Okay. Let's see. So, hello everyone. My name is Jim Hong. I'm a postdoc from David Baum's lab at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Thanks a lot for Jim to give the really great introduction to this topic, which is the messy system in prebiotic chemistry and in the origin of life field. Today, I'm going to talk about a theoretical framework that explains how autocatalysis can make lifelike features gradually arise from complex reaction networks. Important, yet also very puzzling feature of life is that it can self-maintain in an open environment by converting simple food into more complex cellular contents. Many of the contents are highly specialized and interdependent biochemical modules, such as DNAs, RNAs, ribosomes, and enzymes. They are highly interdependent, such that we don't even know how one could function without some other uh, modules. And producing more of such contents allows the cell to grow, divide, and adaptively evolve. Obtain a simplified description of a living cell so as to assist the research on the primitive form of life and the origin of life. People have proposed multiple abstract models, for example, the chemotin. A chemotin has three basic modules, a metabolic cycle to synthesize metabolites by consuming external nutrients, an informational system to store and process genetic information by polymers such as RNAs or DNAs, and a membrane forming system to provide compartmentalization that defines cells and later uh, intracellular organisms. Once the primitive form of cellular life appeared, it would adaptively evolve into the life as we know today. Let us assume that there is some index that measures how much a system looks like life. Then the cellular form of life should of course have a high index, which is beyond the threshold distinguishing life from non-life. On the other hand, we have already known that multiple non-life systems have some lifelike features, which should be plotted on the lower part of this graph. Here are just some examples. First of all, we know that prebiotic chemistry synthesizes biomolecules as amino acids, monosaccharides, and nucleosides without living systems. Some famous examples, just as Jim mentioned, was like the Uri Miller experiment, the foremost reaction, and synthesis of purines from hydrogen cyanide. We also know that some chemical systems can present growth dynamics. For example, in a formal reaction, a glycoaldehyde molecule can react with a formaldehyde molecule to produce a three carbon sugar, which further reacts with formaldehyde again to form a four carbon sugar, which finally dissociates into two molecules of glycoaldehyde. So after one cycle, the glycoaldehyde gets double. This phenomenon can also be found in the organic world. For example, when copper dissolves in nitric acids, nitrogen dioxide shows a growth dynamics because it can first react with an electron from copper to produce nitrite, which then reacts with a proton to produce nitrous acid, which finally reacts with nitric acid to produce two copies of nitrogen dioxide and a water as waste. The phenomenon can also be complicated. For example, the reverse Krebs cycle can result in the growth of oxaloacetates and other carboxylic acids in a cycle. And we know that chemical systems can show oscillatory dynamics and multi-stability. A very famous example is the velosov botinsky reaction which can exhibit chemical oscillation and bistability, which are also seen in some biological phenomena, such as circadian rhythm and metabolic, cycle, uh, metabolic switches. Of course, compartmentalization is possible without living system. For example, diazervates can appear when some types of organic polymers are put in an aqueous phase and meat cells and vesicles can be formed with long chain amphiphiles that are added into an aqueous phase. 
these compartments are known to exhibit lifelike behaviors such as growth and division. Therefore, the origin of life question stands to find the mechanism that can integrate all these abiotic yet lifelike systems and features into a system that is undoubtedly a primitive form of life. And to find such a mechanism, we decided to start with some basic known facts of life. First, we know that life exists in an open environment where there are inflow and outflow matter and energy. We know that the spontaneous direct emergence of life from food brought by the inflow is almost impossible. Otherwise, the origin of life would not be such a complicated question. Now the question is, can that outflow forever try to take life away from the local environment? How could life sustain? The answer is inevitably that life must find a way to convert the matter and energy in the inflow to more life. Otherwise, life cannot compensate for the loss of its internal components due to the outflow. In other words, life must catalyze the production of itself. This is similar to an example we have just covered before. Nitrogen dioxide catalyzes the production of, cell, of itself by consuming electrons, protons, and nitric acids. According to the definition given by IUPAC, that a product of a process catalyzes that process is called autocatalysis. In this talk, I will stick with this definition, although there have been multiple definitions of autocatalysis around. If you're interested in that topic, you may check my recent publication on bioassays. Let's take a closer look at these two autocatalytic processes. Even though they look similar to each other, they actually differ in that life cannot spontaneously emerge from its food, but some nitrogen dioxide can be directly produced from electrons, protons, and nitric acid by some slow reactions. Therefore, we can classify autocatalysis in two types. For seed-dependent autocatalysis, food cannot spontaneously react to produce the autocatalyst. So in order to initiate autocatalysis, it is necessary to add some autocatalysts or chemicals that can react to generate autocatalysts as seeds. Seeds can be introduced by stochastic rare events, so they can be more complicated, such as meteorite impacts and volcanic eruptions. The, the amount of seeds can be very tiny, since autocatalysis should amplify them later. In contrast, for spontaneous autocatalysis, at least some food can spontaneously react, can spontaneously react to produce the autocatalyst. We will call a system that performs dependent autocatalysis as a stas. For the origin of life research, finding stasis in reaction networks, especially the abiotic ones, may provide useful hints. Then how can we find stasis? Well, let us consider a hypothetical example of a reaction network. Here, chemical species are represented by circles and reactions are represented by boxes. The reaction network can also be represented by a stoichiometric matrix, where each column represents a reaction and each row represents a chemical species. A reactant has a negative entry and a product has a positive one. For example, R0 consumes two molecules of F0 and produces one F1. Now, let us provide F0 and F2 as ultimate food. F0 can spontaneously summarize F1 by reaction R0. So F1 is also available as food but no more reaction can be activated here. Since other reactions, each requires at least one reactant that is not yet available. Then let us add A1 as a candidate C, which turns out to react with F1 to produce two A2. And A2 reacts with F2 to regenerate A1, completing an autocatalytic cycle. 
A2 can also dimerize to A3 by R3. Now the question is, how can we infer that a dash exists by analyzing the matrix? Remember that all the species become accessible only after A1 is seeded or A2 is seeded actually. So we can parse the matrix into four segments and focus on the lower right segment representing the internal system, which is induced by the seed. This is because other rows represent food that are freely available and other columns have zero entries for internal species. Note that not all the internal species are necessarily other catalysts because even if there is a stats, there could also be some waste or side products among the internal species. To find the stats, we want to combine the heat induced reactions such that all internal species can be produced by consuming external food. But in a specific case, combine four R1s, five R2s, and one R3, we will get a net reaction where F1 and F2 react to generate A1, A2, and A3 with A1 and or A2 provided as the seeds. Generally, whether such linear combinations exist can be calculated by linear programming. Now we have a method that detects stasis. This organized network has some very interesting features which can give rise to a chemical ecosystem. I will explain what this means later. The propagation of bacteria supports seed-dependent autocatalysis because it consumes food to produce more bacteria. And in ecology, its population dynamics is usually described by the logistic model, where N is the population size, R, the intrinsic growth rate, and K, the carrying capacity. And if we consider a very simple reversible autocatalytic reaction, M plus F goes reversibly into two Ms, we can show that if this reaction system is put in a well-mixed flow reactor, the dynamics of M concentration can be expressed in this form. Here, Ka, Kb are respectively the rate constants of the forward and reverse reactions. And Ko is the dilution rate of the flow reactor. And small f is the concentration of the food in the inflow. Note that although this equation seems very complicated, it actually shares a similar form to the logistic model. Therefore, we may treat a chemical stance as if it were a biological population. Therefore, it is not surprising that there can be ecological interactions between chemical stasis, just as there are ecological interactions between biological species. First, stasis may compete for the shared food, which could result in competitive coexistence or com competitive exclusion, where one goes completely extinction. And the rate constants of the autocatalytic reactions will determine their final fate. It is also possible that a DAS, for example, the blue one, may consume the autocatalysts of the orange DAS as food, resulting in a predator-prey interaction, which may result in complex dynamics such as oscillation. This can also be mutualistic. For example, orange stats consumes a waste species, the blue stats as food. They both benefit from this relationship. One stats consumes a waste species of the other as an indispensable food and vice versa. Then the two stances cooperate to survive. Which, are, which means that they are interdependent. Finally, the interaction between stasis may result, may result in bistability. Here is just one example where the waste of one stas reduces the food availability of the other, such that whichever stas is seeded first will have an advantage over the other. 
Such a feature can result in frozen accidents, which we often see in evolution and ecological succession. Chemical ecosystem requires multiple stasis, so we need to explain how these stasis, especially the complex ones, can come into being. Go back to the simple example we have just analyzed, this stacks. And we will call it FA. We also assume that there were some other external food species, F3 and F4, available at the beginning. Then we see steps B, C, C. With stepwise seeding, the diversity and complexity of the entire system and the chemical species that are available as food for future stasis increase so that it could become easier and easier for a newly introduced seed to find appropriate food for its autocatalysis. And autocatalysts with higher complexity could become more likely to be supported because more complex food, or food species are available. With hierarchically organized stasis, we will also have a new phenomenon that is not covered before, but is very interesting and important, scaffolding. Now, let's say that F3 gradually depleted, then what will happen? Well, we will see that parts of FC, the entire stats D are lost. There, let's say that some environmental conditions, for example, pH value and temperature change, such that R1 is inhibited. Almost all components of stats A will be lost. But interestingly, the rest of the network still survive by feeding on external food because stats C and stats D provide catalysts that can replace the function of the lower stasis, still able to convert F1 and F2 to A1. Now, the red components of the network are the scaffolds. And if what we observe today is the system without them, the scaffold become missing links. And perhaps an important reason for the origin of life to be a really difficult question is that some scaffolds that were necessary in the past, especially before the origin of life, no longer exist today. One may suspect that these are just idealized populations, but we can actually try to find stasis in real chemical reaction networks. In an abiotic radiolysis reaction network, we find the stats feeding on methane, nitrogen monoxide, and visible light. Note that formaldehyde part of the stats. So the foremost reaction may feed on this stats, forming a two-tier hierarchy, given that local formaldehyde dimerization is much less likely than a seeding of glycoaldehyde from elsewhere. In the biochemical reaction database, we also found a trophic hierarchy. If we provide these simple inorganic chemicals as food, they will spontaneously react to produce a tier zero food system. And if we see some glycoaldehyde, a tier one stats will be induced. The core process of this stats is shown here. It is fairly complicated, but linear algebra, the linear programming, just guarantees that it is autocatalytic. Tier one stats can synthesize multiple small organic molecules, such as monosaccharides, alcohols, aldehydes, amino acids, and carboxylic acids, which are very important because they may act as chelating agents, which might promote the catalytic activity of transition metals in the environment. And if we further see acid together, a tier two stats that can synthesize multiple adenine based cofactors may be induced. These cofactors can enable new catalyzed reaction pathways that were not possible with the tier one stats only. A simpler, but more efficient carbon fixation pathway is also enabled, which may convert 
hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide into small organic molecules. Furthermore, long chain fatty acids can be synthesized by this PR2 cells, which provide the material basis for many cells and vesicles. Finally, activation of the PR2 cells make, makes two reactions in the PR1 no longer necessary for the maintenance of the rest of the autocatalytic system. So these two reactions become removable scaffold. So yes, this is in a hierarchically organized stasis exist in real reaction networks. With the stats theory, the presence and integration of different lifelike features can be unified under a common framework. We propose that the origin of life is a process like this. First, sequential activation of new stasis generates a chemical ecosystem where multiple lifelike features, such as trophic hierarchy, mutualism, competition, and occupancy advantage may arise. Then these ecological interactions result in evolution-like dynamics, gradually making the reaction system into one that is more lifelike due to adaptation. Finally, primitive forms of life emerge. Or we may remember the framework as autocatalysis first, ecology next, evolution later, and finally, the familiar biosphere. Next steps, we may further explore under what conditions ecological interactions can combine to generate evolution-like dynamics, since there are both intriguing similarities and dramatic differences between evolution and the ecological process, such as ecological succession. We can also try searching for simpler, experimentally testable, evolvable chemical systems in a larger set of, reactor, of reactions. It would be fantastic if we can experimentally show that some abiotic systems can adaptively evolve without genetic polymers. Finally, the stats theory may be extrapolated to other fields, such as developmental biology and gene regulation research, providing a unified framework all the way from non-life to life. With this, I would like to thank all the members of the Palm Group and our friends and collaborators. I would also like to thank NASA, NSF, and UW Medicine for supporting our series of research on the origin of life. And finally, thank you very much for attending this seminar. If you are interested in our research, more technical details can be found in these papers. Thank you so much, Jen. And I'll just make a note that if anyone has questions for Jen, just hold on to them. We're going to do a joint Q&A session at the end. And I'll, I'll also note that I wasn't able to interject uh, between Jim to introduce Jen uh, due to technical difficulties, but I still want to do that. And then we'll move on to Ankit. Um, so, for Jen, um, he is a postdoctoral associate in the Bond Lab in Wisconsin, at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, University of Wisconsin Man Madison. He obtained his BS in Biological Sciences at Fudan University, Shanghai, where he also studied copy number variations in human genomes in Dr. Fang Jiang's group. He then obtained his PhD in evolution, ecology, and population biology at Washington University in St. Louis, where he studied non-neutral synonymous mutations and codon usage biases in eukaryotic genomes in Dr. Yeda Ben-Shahar's group. He is now working with Dr. Baum on the theory of chemical ecosystems, as we heard, which states that autocatalytic motifs can organize chemical reaction networks into a state similar to biological ecosystems, which allows for the emergence of multiple life-like features from abiotic and even inorganic systems. He is also interested in bridging theories and experiments in origin of life research, as we heard. So next, we are going to hear from Ann Kitt. And Ankit did his PhD at the Jawaharlal uh, Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, India, where he studied dynamic, dynamic supermolecular systems. 
He then joined Professor Rain Ulgen's lab at the Advanced Science Research Center, City University of New York, as a science postdoctoral fellow. There, his work mainly focuses on the development of dynamic peptide libraries for answering questions pertaining to adaption in complex reactive mixtures. So you can take it away, Ankit. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, for a kind introduction. I'll share my uh, slides. Uh, the slides are visible, right? Yes, but we see all the PowerPoint and now it's full screen, perfect. Uh, hello all, uh, thank you for a kind invitation. And uh, I'm Ankit and uh, I'll talk about uh, adaptation patterns in complex peptide libraries. So pertaining to origins of life, there is mess everywhere. If you look at, uh, I mean, chemical mess is what I mean. Uh, everywhere. Uh, and that's how supposedly life started. Uh, looking just as uh, just at uh, just at a peptide or a protein space, you would imagine that there are 20 different amino acids with millions of years of evolution that gave rise to a system which is uh, you know near inf infinite uh, number of interactions, near uh, 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 millions of numbers of proteins. Uh, that is, life as we know now. However, if you are to look at, let's say, chemical origins of life, perhaps a way to start looking at it is this regime where it is sort of an oligopeptide regime where there is a combination of two to seven amino acids. Still, there are a lot of combinations, but that is a regime that one could look at to see if there are biases app or how do these mixtures actually behave uh, when reactions happen or when they are exposed to a stimuli and such. So the questions that remain here is that, can you actually create a complex ensemble? Uh, but not only create it, can you bias it? And to add on to that, after creating an ensemble which can be biased, can you actually analyze it completely to see how the mixtures are forming or you know, what are the products formed depending on uh, what stimuli are being uh, exposed to the system? Uh, so with that uh, question in mind, and this is specifically for peptides, uh, what we were working on, what we started with is dynamic peptide libraries, which is essentially a way to have a, a controlled complexity uh, that you can create out of peptides. Now, to explain to you why that, what that is, so instead of actually having an uncontrollable reaction by let's say a heating cooling a system and oligomerizing amino acids, what we realized was that with an enzyme called thermolysin, which is actually an endoamidase, we can reversibly combine and hydrolyze dipeptides to form longer peptides essentially. Now, since uh, there are two advantages here, one, uh, thermolysin is amenable to a lot of functionalities. So you can actually have uh, a different kind of functionalities in these dipeptides that can then will result in different kind of functionalities in these longer peptides. That's one. Second, we know the way thermolysin combines these dipeptides. There's a pattern to which it combines it. Uh, uh, and hence, what we can do is we can theoretically predict all the kind of products that we form and hence analyze a mixture completely. So you actually don't form an uncontrollable mixture, but you form a controllable complexity. In this particular case, uh, we go up to components which are hundreds of components together uh, of, of longer peptides together, uh, which actually then we then go on to make fingerprint maps out of it. But the, uh, to tell you what sort of functionalities we handled, uh, there are this dipeptide has obviously two residues and the Z residues are the hydrophobic ones, which is either glycine, alanine, or valine. Uh, X residue is various functionalities, uh, uh, positive, negative, neutral, uh, slightly aromatic, uh, these functionalities with it. Hence, this is a mix of hydrophobicities and functionalities. Uh, what we are, which actually gives us a chemical space of charge, 
uh, of uh, uh, different hydrophobicity. And what we then try to do is uh, try make fingerprint maps out of it of the products that come out of this system. And now to, just to point out, uh, uh, the majority of the products that actually form of the oligomers that form in our system are tetrapeptides. Uh, there are systems where hexapeptides form as well. I'll talk about them as well. But the majority of the products are tetrapeptides, and that's what we analyze our mixtures uh, for. Uh, and the stimuli that we are working on is either heat, which is uh, 37 to 60 degrees centigrade, or uh, ATP. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about in detail about it. So uh, first, what we did was we started looking at single hydrophobicities, just single glycine systems, uh, or alanine or single valine systems. And then later in the slide, in the work, uh, in the presentation I'll show you about, we'll combine all these three to go about it. Uh, so uh, let's start with just simple glycine libraries. And let me guide you through with the way that we represent data here. So this is a heat map showing tetrapeptide uh, abundances of individual tetrapeptides. These are five dipeptides, which give rise to 25 uh, tetrapeptides. And uh, in a tetrapeptide, first two component amino acid are the x-axis here in blue, and the second two component is the y-axis here. Hence, for example, a square like that is GKGK, this square is GHGR, and this square is GRGH, and you know, sequences thereof. So this is, a, and uh, essentially uh, a map like this would show uh, the more blue the map of a particular point is, higher the abundance of that particular point of uh, that particular peptide. Uh, that's the idea here. So we ran this uh, reaction uh, essentially with five dipeptides, thermalycin with ATP. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, abundance without ATP and this is the abundance with ATP. The map here you see is a difference map between them. The yellow parts will show the, uh, the peptides that have down-regulated and the blue uh, parts will show the peptides which are up-regulated. Another point to mention, that these dipeptides are ordered with charge. Hence, what you actually see is, if you see abundance coming up in the top left corner, that would be positively charged species that would come up. If there was abundance coming up here, that would be negative charged species that would come up. Hence, in this particular map, which is a difference map between with and without ATP, what you actually see, there is a higher abundance of positive charge sequences. Uh, you can make a bar chart out of it, which says the same thing in which in a glycine uh, system, when you add ATP to it, there is a higher abundance of positive charge systems, which is essentially uh, a library reacting to ATP presence and uh, amplifying uh, peptides, which can bind to ATP. Uh, we actually then did a variation of ATP. We even did ADP and AMP. And what you can see is that, and this is of a similar scale, so you can actually compare, is that the amplification uh, goes, uh, decreases, uh, with decrease in ATP, in fact, is completely down when you compare to ADP and AMP. Hence, this is a ATP-driven uh, amplification. What you can also do is these heat maps that you have, uh, you can make, uh, you can do principal component analysis on these and uh, look at a bird's eye view of how these uh, ensembles are uh, sort of emerging. So what you actually see here, and I'll just guide you through, through some of the points, is that the, black, the points in black are essentially the points over time without ATP. But when you, the greens are with AMP, the, uh, the blue is with ADP. So you can see that the, uh, the ensemble is changing as you add the kind of phosphates. However, it's completely different when you add ATP and you see that the 100% ATP, 100 millimolar ATP is completely different and has a logical variation from its starting point. Uh, which goes to show that you can actually make these fingerprint patterns and analyze this full ensemble. And this is a 25 product ensemble essentially that you can make out of it. What we then did was we similar analysis was done on various other hydrophobicities like glycine, obviously I've shown, but alanine alone and valine alone, we've did it. And uh, something to point out here, uh, this is a principal component analysis of these different hydrophobicities. And just to point out, is that this uh, violet is the distribution of glycine libraries when no ATP is present. Black is when in glycine libraries when 100, when 100 millimolar ATP is present. You can see there's a difference between these two ensembles showing that there's a huge difference between with and without ATP. However, if you look at 
alanine, which is uh, with and without ATP, which is green and orange, or valine with and without ATP, which is red and blue, you see very less differences. There are differences, but very less differences as compared to glycine. And these differences are also not similar in the sense glycine is much more uh, biased towards uh, charges. However, alanine and valine are biased towards charges, but also include histidines in it. More hydrophobicities is what they are including with it. Hence, what we actually conclude from, and we have a detailed kinetic study uh, uh, for this, but for this we conclude is that if libraries are run with lower hydrophobicities, that would mean lesser bias towards self-assembly of its own, you can get a easier bias towards charge. However, when you have more hydrophobicities, they tend to have a company charge, yes, because ATP is present, but they tend to also include hydrophobicities. And it's not that easy to bias them as opposed to a, a simple a glycine sort of system. Hence, what you can see is that even in tetrapeptides of very simple dipeptides, uh, you can see that biases or uh, changes in ensemble based on hydro hydrophobicity start to appear. And uh, especially in uh, the VX case, uh, we saw there's a lot of uh, sorry hexapeptides that evolved. And I'll walk you through this uh, bar chart. So this bar chart is an overlap of uh, two systems. So let me walk you through. So these are the hexapeptides that we formed. These are ordered by charge. So this end is a highly positive charge. This is a highly negative charge. Uh, the uh, y-axis is obviously the abundance with the light bars showing without ATP, dark bars showing with ATP. Now, what these blue dots are, are essentially ratio of with ATP to without ATP, essentially the amplification. How much of amplification of a species has happened with ATP as opposed to without ATP? Now, what you see is, since y-axis is, uh, is ordered with charge, what you also see is the amplification ratio has a clear correlation with charge. Hence pointing towards that even in VX, which was not that biased towards charge, as you oligomerize, you start increasing its ampli amplification towards charge. The, uh, the species that amplify are much more charged essentially. And this is something that we actually curiously see in uh, cryo EMs as well. This is the cryo EM of the ensembles uh, with and without, uh, this is without ATP and this is with ATP. What you see with it, without ATP, what we see is a lot of fibers. Uh, that form, uh, which is a, essentially characteristic of beta sheet formation. We've done a lot of IR to actually figure that out, that that's true. And with ADP, the beta sheet actually breaks again by IR proof, but also you also see these particles that form. Obviously I'm telling this as particles, I don't have enough proof to show that these are condensates, but essentially what these are, are oppositely charged electrolytes coming together to forming these particles. But this does form in a, uh, in a, a valine system alone, essentially, when there are oligomers which form, which are highly charge amplified, uh, that form in the system. So you can't bias uh, perhaps easily the VX tetrapeptide. However, when, as you lengthen uh, the oligomers, they start biasing as well. So oligomerization also plays a role in essentially how you can bias the system. Then finally, what we did was we mixed all the 15 dipeptides together. These 15 dipeptides, this is a central tetrapeptide map of that. Uh, this, uh, just to point out, this 15 uh, uh, dipeptides would give you 225 tetrapeptides. Uh, and these all 225 tetrapeptides are mapped in these heat maps. And I'll walk you through how to read these heat maps. And like last time, uh, x-axis is essentially the first half of the uh, tetrapeptide. Uh, y-axis is the second half of the tetrapeptide. Uh, and they are grouped as glycine first, alanine second, and then valine. And individual glycine, alanine, valine, they are then ordered by charge, like lysine, arginine, histidine, serine, and aspartic acid. Hence, what you see is that this, if you see amplification in this region, that would be uh, a purely glycine-rich amplification. And then within that, you can see if it's positive charge, negative charge. And alternatively, this region here would be highly valine rich, and then you can ch do charge different differentiation among them. Uh, so uh, in this um, uh, system, which is essentially uh, different kinds of order are present, different kinds of charges are present in the system. And this is there is a co-selection that's going to happen with charge and order. So what we did was 
we first, this is a difference map at 37 degrees centigrade uh, subtracted with 60 degrees centigrade, hence pointing, and there is no ATP present, just a temperature dependent uh, profile of the system. The blue systems, uh, blue peptides would be uh, that amplify uh, at lower temperature and uh, uh, yellow species would be that melt out essentially at the temperature. And what you actually see here is that there is, and these maps, these bar charts are essentially the hydrophobicities. What are the hydro hydrophobicities that are getting amplified? And what are the charges that are getting amplified? So with, uh, with temperature, what you see is that this is a gradation pattern, essentially. That means at lower temperature, valine is what exists. Valine rich species is what exists, which melt out when you increase temperature, essentially. And the charge, there is no specific charge selection. It's near neutral selection, that is. And as you can see, as you can clearly see with the gradation pattern, as also shown in these bar charts, this is highly hydrophobic stuff. That is what's getting amplified. However, at lower temperature, when you add ATP, and this is again now a difference map between with ATP and without ATP at lower temperatures. What you actually see is that moving away from these gradations, these islands start forming. And as I pointed out, islands are forming in these highly charged corners, highly positively charged corners, which is again a response to ATP. However, these islands are also forming in glycine rich systems. So what you can actually see is that from these bar charts is that this is a positive system. However, it's uh, mildly glycine rich. Hence at lower temperatures, there is you know, uh, uh, glycine systems which are getting uh, amplified easily. Uh, that's what's uh, happening here. However, when you actually increase temperature, what you actually see is that this, these are still islands. That would mean these are still positive charge species that are amplifying. However, these are now valine rich species. And what we actually, and this is also clear with the bar charts. These are positive charge species, but these are valine rich species that form or valine combinations with alanine and such. What we actually think is happening is that at, at lower temperature, it's obviously just the charge, which is actually uh, uh, amplifying it. However, at higher temperature, there is a charge plus order, which is doing it. What it means is that when increased temperature, everything actually melts, only those exist that can bind to ATP and assemble. And that's the valine rich system that uh, exists. So what, this is an adaptive system, which, in which you can li literally look at you know, 225 products and look at, at how a complete ensemble is changing over time uh, with these systems. And uh, just to sum up, that's uh, uh, what we actually did was we created a controlled way to create biomolecular complexity. This is a unique point in the sense that general reactions in which general polymerization reactions of amino acids in prebiotic context are done in a more prebiotically relevant heat cool system, though it's more prebiotically relevant, the complexity it creates is actually untenable. You cannot actually decipher that completely. Also, you cannot actually uh, look at all functionalities in that. So what we did was we let go, we sacrificed essentially the kind of reaction we are doing. We are doing enzymatic reaction, but we in turn, what we gain is a controlled complexity where you can actually look at complete components of the ensemble. Uh, again, we went up to 225 uh, tetrapeptide mixtures with hexapeptides that are even more. And you can, each of the, these systems, you, essentially these heat maps are fingerprints of uh, how an ensemble are, is changing. And our point is essentially this, that there is biases happening even at much smaller scale. You don't have to be long proteins to actually bias yourself. Even in you know tetrapeptide uh, stage, tetrapeptide to hexapeptide stage, the biases starts happening uh, with respect to stimuli. And uh, uh, just to acknowledge this work, uh, I've had help of amazing coworkers uh, with this work uh, and uh, uh, a brilliant PI that I was working with, uh, Professor Ryan, and uh, obviously the funding agencies that helped our work. Uh, this work was recently published, and uh, you can uh, look for more details there. And thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Ankit. And as I mentioned before, we are going to do a joint uh, discussion session with any of our speakers today. So how we'll do that is you can enter questions into the chat or you can raise your hand, in which case we can unmute you so that you can ask your question yourself. 
And on that note, I see that Kevin has his hand up. So you should be able to unmute Kevin. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Can you can yes. you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you for two very interesting talks, I have to say, Zen and and Ankit. I got a question for both one question for each, if that's if that's allowable. First of all, Zen. What you've shown is basically sort of almost self-replicating autocatalytic systems. And obviously, as you know, there's the, the origins of life, the st camps are still divided into was it information first with say RNA, catalytic RNAs that can catalyze their own rep self-replication or, or um, some sort of uh, metabolism first. So I would say my, my comment would be, do you think then you could sort of like get to systems whereby you've got the two together, which then coalesce, if you like. And that is many, that's where evolution comes in. I would say you've got possible evolution with an inform, information based system first, but with met metabolism, you don't have that. I would say a coalition of the two would eventually give the jump to evolution and based the RNA world, the, pre the precursor RNA world that existed before the one we have now. So then, you could ask, you could, if you could, what, what's, your, what's your comment on that? Okay. So the, there are actually multiple concepts and you know, complications around, the con around these concepts. First, which is, which is metabolism, which is RNA replication. So in defin by definition, RNA replication is a form of autocatalysis. And it is also supported by metabolism, actually, in our uh, theoretical framework, I just showed two tiers in the biochemical reaction network, but because some nucleotides are synthesized at a tier two. So you may imagine that RNA system might invade the system by providing a tier three C-dependent autocatalytic system. For example, maybe some dry wet cycles will take the RNA monomers to uh, uh, to convert them into RNA polymers and reintroduced into the system. And then if these RNAs can provide some catalytic effects and can also use the uh, monomers provided by the previous stasis to replicate, then you will have an RNA system feeding on the lower tier metabolism. And on the other hand is about the definition of evolution. This is actually somehow tricky because we usually understand evolution from the perspective of the modern synthesis, where there were genetic polymers carrying information. And we usually assume that genetic information has to be carried by some polymer systems. But recently we did some calculations which turned out that um, some inheritable information does not necessarily need polymers. And also some other, some work from other groups, for example, um, the lipid world, uh, research groups, they propose that you can actually have composition uh, composition of different chemicals as an analog information which can be inherited following a different um, heritability pattern than the polymer-based ones. So what I would suggest is that uh, RNA replication could be very hard if you do not have a pre uh, preceding metabolic or autocatalytic cycle that can provide enough activated uh, nucleotides. Otherwise, the RNAs, even the functional ones, can be really easy to get lost and very vulnerable to the invasion of some you know, hitchhikers or parasitic RNAs that do not do anything but just take the advantage of the uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So that would be my major comment. Coalescence is possible, but uh, if we can calculate the likelihood of different hypotheses, I slightly prefer metabolism first over RNA first. Okay. But I think, I mean, I mean I, 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 when you said that you don't need sort of polymers, I mean, what's the, for example, if we're thinking of RNA, what's the minimum number of nucleotides you need? I mean, I, I can't think it, you could have replication starting with just very simple, like one nucleotide or something similar to that. I think you would need several nucleotides. And yes. what's so, the smallest yes. sort of so length? The replication, that, that relates to the Fermer's paradox in the RNA mm. first theory, mm -hmm. it's like, the, yeah. like the threshold paradox that you need at least several tens or the hundreds of 
nucleotides in a sequence to have a error correcting yeah. RNA dependent mm -hmm. RNA polymers. So you need some really magic jump from monomers to large ones. But I think a more probable path was that RNAs were generated originally not for the function of catalyst or genetic information carrier, but for something else. Maybe they just uh, moder they just modify the coafter base probability increase in the compartmentalization somehow. And later when you have a system that's somehow enriched for longer and longer polymers, then catalytic effect emerged as a side effect or side product. And then later the evolution might jump in and then select RNA more and more as genetic information carrier or catalyst. Okay. And also because there, I think there have been some research papers on um, how uh, metal ions and inorganic molecules can catalyze metabolism even without polymers. So that might be possible, I guess. Okay. Yeah. And I would say though, you need, so for, for life as we know it, you need a poly electrolyte, I would have to say. And I, and I would say ne ne it need not necessarily have the same bases that we have in RNA and DNA or the same sugars, but it will have to have a sugar polyphosphate backbone. That's based on work I've done and based on what I've seen. That's what I think is essential to life yeah. as we know it. And it may just be that while we have RNA, this for the ribose sugars and the, the nuclear bases, is down to prebiotic enrichment. It's down to what's most abundant and what can be put together more easily, I would say. In which yeah. case life, as we know it in, a, in an aqueous environment, like we have here on Earth, may be universal. You know. So the, there are multiple hypotheses around these. If I remember correctly, people have also proposed like peptide, sugar, polymers, or depsy peptides, or even some lifelike systems, not in aqueous phase, but around the interface between aqueous phase or solid phase, or at the interface between aqueous phase and I, no I mean, aqueous phase. And sometimes the air aerosols are also proposed as a possible candidate phase. So. And I, I'm very biased towards nucleic acids because of the, it's basically, it's a polymer, its properties are independent of its sequence, which is not the case for peptides and proteins. And so mutation, yeah. a mutation of protein, one amino acid can change it fundamentally. For example, hemoglobin, you know, with the, the, the uh, was it the, if my aspartic acid re at residue six, is replaced with a valine with a sort of very uh, sort of like with a lipophilic valine it changes its solubility completely so anyway i better not say because obviously we've got, I've got to give other people a chance to ask questions so but thank you very much and and kit with one quick question i noticed your pe peptide libraries in the presence of atp you seem to favor the positive residues in in, in, the, in the absence of atp the negative is that just down to the fact that Obviously, the, the sort of like repulsion of negative, of like, sort of like kilobit repulsion between, for example, ATP and aspartic acids. Is that simply down to that, do you think? Looking um, at your mostly due to that. Uh, the, what we actually also observed that, for example, there is a curious thing happening in our system in which as the system evolves, there is co-evolutions in them too. For example, uh, if there's a, uh, uh, a positively charged sequence that evolves, there is a minor negatively charged uh, system that starts evolving and there are kinetic uh, proof is there to actually corroborate that, which is actually binding with the peptide essentially mm -hmm. to amplify with that. Uh, mostly, however, this case is that it's the ATP binding which is actually doing it. That's with most systems. Uh, so the inherent binding of the inherent uh, property of a system is just to either go by near neutral charges uh, or minor or negative charge incorporation. However, with ATP, there's a clear bias towards positive mm -hmm. charge. Okay. Thank you. Two excellent talks. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed. So uh, going to the chat for questions. Uh, there's actually a 16 year old listener who wants to know if you have any guidance uh, for entering into the field of astrobiology. So maybe you could 
take something from your journey and share um, how you became successful? So I would say study hard because it's like when, when I was 16, I actually did not know exactly what I would do in the future. But I know that learning things from different aspects, especially from different fundamental science fields, will nonetheless help me no matter what path I will finally, I will finally choose. So at that time, I just study very hard in every course, in every course provided by the school and also try to read uh, books that are not directly related to the courses taken in the classroom, but just anything interesting, reading it uh, as much as possible. And also um, another way to find how to enter the path of astrobiology is to, you know, try to go online or uh, subscribe to some TV channels about uh, with the documentaries about astrobiology and chemistry, physics, and biology, this stuff. Get a as get a foundation as wide as possible, which will finally give you more sense about you know what kind of paradigm or theoretical framework or experiments you would like to choose. So that would be my suggestion. Um. Yeah, uh, so again, as pointed out, 16 is fairly young. However, uh, whichever topic of research you end up choosing or you don't choose, I my general advice would be is treat failures as more important as successes. Uh, I've, I learned that personally from various projects, you know, uh, in these fields. Uh, failures have possibilities of becoming bigger breakthroughs as, you know, successes. Uh, that, that's what I would give advice, essentially, whichever field you end up choosing. But that's important to keep because research is that way. Uh, yeah. That's great advice. Thank you both. Um, so we actually have a question from Needy about the Sadaz. I'm sorry, you said it so many times. I did not. All right. I, I um, thought. Maybe I did not say the full name of that. So it's seed dependent autocatalytic system. So first it is autocatalytic, meaning that uh, the component of the system, or at least some component of the system, catalyzes the formation or production of the entire system. So it is autocatalytic and it's seed dependent because before you put an autocatalyst or some chemicals that can be converted into autocatalyst as a seed, you cannot initiate that process. For example, uh, if you want to initiate the production of more bacteria, you first need to add some bacteria as seed into the food. Otherwise the food will always just be food there. So would that be a satisfactory answer, maybe? Yeah, that was a great recap. Um, and then we have a question from Michael about whether you can build physical structures into any of these systems, for example, clay or glass. I think either of you could, uh, or both of you could take that on. Uh, yeah, so in my particular case, yes. Uh, uh, that is something that's uh, ongoing in Ryan's lab as well, uh, in which essentially what you can do is this is a reversible equilibrium and whatever that binds to, whatever peptides that bind to any uh, stimuli can bias a stimuli, uh, can bias a library. And uh, in my case, specifically clay, yes. There is a lot of good work done. I mean, there's a huge body of work on uh, amino acid interaction or peptide interaction with clay. And that is something uh, we want to take leverage of. Uh, it's the experiment is, not slight, uh, not completely straightforward because you know clay by themselves have some activated clays by themselves have their own uh, reactions and we would rather prefer the actual reaction happening just by the enzyme. However, yes, uh, the answer is yes. For me, I would say the most promising structure. I would say some porous minerals or clay, just as. Uh, you mentioned, because these ones provided like multiple mini reactors. If you put them in a, a flow with other with abundant inorganic or small organic molecules, 
So you will have multiple flow reactors running at the same time, which might select for some photocatalytic system. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have, I think, another question from Michael again. Uh, so he's wondering how the great oxidation event would have changed evolution. Um, you can think of how that might, if included into your models, how it might change things. Any comments on that? Um, uh, in my particular case, again, uh, I, even though I'm not looked at, my the reaction that I've looked at is essentially independent of any kind of oxidation. However, uh, I would like to add that this is a specific point that we faced in some clays, essentially, uh, where uh, they can modify, uh, you know, specific species depending on if they can oxidize stuff or no. Again, the great oxidation event would have had perhaps slightly, obviously, a great deal different composition of clays as opposed to what exists on Earth now. Uh, and adding to that, what this essentially adds is a different aspect of different of uh, selections that can happen in a reaction or different kind of uh, uh, side products, which can again, uh, you know, amplify and uh, poison, either poison or, you know, acceler accelerate a reaction. So yes, uh, in my specific case, I would add that, yeah, there are some amino, amino acids which are amenable to oxidation as well. For example, tyrosine, tryptophan and such, which can form uh, melanin-like species. So yeah, the in, uh, with amino acids, that would have been a huge sea of change, uh, essentially because uh, the uh, the uh, other species are much more essentially electroactive, uh, which give you different kinds of uh, reactions to work with. Uh, yeah, uh, that that's the experience I've had with different kinds of oxidation states with the peptide organization. For me. Uh, great oxidation period, I would say it's very much outside my expertise because it is after the origin of life, I guess. It's like the, uh, after you have an evolution with the oxygen generating photosynthesis. So I would say from the perspective of, of stance, great oxidation dramatically changed the available food in the big environment, in the biosphere, which could which would greatly uh, change the major selective pressure over different species, and then there will you will have many older species or living system died out because of the oxygen, but you will have more other species generated because oxygen is a very high energy and highly oxidized food. So that would be my answer. Thank you for that. Um, well, we can take a few more moments and people can enter their questions or raise their hand to ask a question. And um, while people are maybe getting any questions out, uh, I'll, I'll point out that we do have a Slack that we can continue discussion on. So I'll go ahead and put a link for our Slack in the chat. And then if there are any topics that you wanna hear in the future, since we are doing themes for all these sessions, uh, you can join the Slack and, and let us know, hey, I'm interested in this and give suggestions or give suggestions on maybe a lab you would like to hear from. Uh, we can possibly do that. So. Um, yeah, I don't see anything new coming in. Do you, any of you have questions for each other? Or, um, oh, here we go. There's uh, a question from Garrett. So it is, uh, valine libraries have easier amplification in a cooler environment. So I think do valine libraries have an e easier amplification? And, um, he's interested if a Venus-like planet is inevitable. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, Bailey libraries have actually easier amplification or a larger amplification at higher temperature. Uh, the reason for that is that at lower temperature, they just form kinetic traps of uh, aggregations of themselves. The dipeptides by themselves have their aggregation propensities. And uh, when you heat it up, uh, that sort of uh, clears up and you start getting uh, more amplification. Uh, with the Venus-like planet thing, obviously there's a lot different in Venus apart from just temperature. Uh, it's very tough to say, uh, especially with my reaction scheme or any kind of essentially uh, amino acid polymerization. Uh, how would it happen in a different different chemical environment completely as well? Uh, I imagine, and I'm not an expert here, and if so, if I'm wrong, please correct me. I think it's highly acidic, uh, the environment there. Uh, and to point out, uh, uh, there has been a great body of work essentially by uh, Professor Cronin and other co-workers as well, who worked on um, uh, oligomerization of amino acids in highly acidic systems. Uh, they, you know, there's a heat and cool cycle they work with uh, and that sort of uh, polymerizes them. So I would imagine that that would be okay. However, that process is only amenable to hydrophobic systems. Again, because things will change drastically. They will, you know, uh, degrade, uh, de-racemize, uh, sorry, well, racemize and such at higher acidic pHs. So uh, there is a lot more to do apart from just temperature, I would imagine. So, um, Okay, so I don't see anything new has come into the chat. Like I said, if you have questions for each other that you think would inform the discussion, feel free. Um, but if not, we can also wrap up early. I'm fine. All right. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Um, it was a great session today. Thank you for your time. And also thank you everyone who's here for coming. Right, and we can head out.